Each year we give an award for the best startup and we have gathered the best startups here in the field of health tech. 380 startups from 40 countries applied for this and we have narrowed it down to just a very few, a little more than a dozen, and we're gonna hear from them now. The way we're gonna do this is each startup gets the stage for two and a half minutes. They get to pitch you, our audience, on their idea, their product. We're gonna do this in a lightning round, two and a half minutes. Let's bring up the very first startup, Ambigate. Welcome to the stage. Yeah, hello, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's an honor to be here today. My name is Caroline, and I'm one of the three founders of Ambigate. We are a University of Tübingen spin-off developing innovative motion sensing solutions. Before I present our product, Iriha, I have a question. Who already suffered from back pain? Please raise your hand. Yeah, be assured you're not alone. Back pain issues affect 70% of the Germans. These are 56 million people, causing an economic damage of 55 billion euro per year. Usually, patients get a prescription for physiotherapy with six times 20 minutes. This is not enough for a sustainable recovery. Therefore, physios recommend home exercises for a better therapy progress. But there are two main um, challenges for home therapy. Motivation and false execution. IRIHA shall support us to overcome those challenges. IRIHA is a video game based exercise therapy for domestic and business environment. It can be used preventively, parallel to physiotherapy, and for corporate healthcare programs. As an exercise game, the system provides medical exercises in a virtual environment supported by a virtual trainer. A 3D sensor analyzes the patient's executions and locates false movements in real time. And during the workout, DC-specific parameters are measured and sent to the physiotherapist for a dynamic therapy adaption. But what makes IREA disruptive? We will change the therapy market fundamentally. Advantages include patient's home training data for physios, lower costs for health insurances, 24-7 training for patients at home, and companies can provide an easy solution for a healthier workplace. Starting with back pain, the system later will be used for all kinds of kinesiatrics. And it's not only us believing in IREHA, but also health insurance, eight professors, the Federal Ministry of Economics, and the largest physiotherapy association of Germany. We combine classic therapy with digital media in a mass market. Our vision is a healthier future for all of us. Thank you. Thank you very much. We are moving right along to the next one. This is a segment that will not be running over. Let's bring up Amparo. You guys are next. Thank you, everyone. Hello there. My name is Lucas. I'm from Amparo. Um, give me some information for you. One in every 200 people in the world is an amputee which leads to at least 50 million people. Every year there are two million new amputees in developing countries alone. And they're all gonna need a prosthesis. So a prosthetic leg has three main components. The foot and the pylon are available in different sizes. The socket, on the other hand, must be individually customized and handcrafted by a specialized technician in an equipped prosthetic center. Plus, it takes several weeks to be done. Well, Infrastructure, expertise, and time limits to that means that 80% of the world's lower limb amputees, they do not have access to modern prosthesis. And that's why we have developed Amparo, which is a pre-made socket, and it aims to improve access to prosthesis. So Amparo, uh, it offers an immediate solution with a simpler and more effective feeding process. It does not require any special tools, but only simple training. It's made of a low temperature thermoplastic, so if you leave it for 15 minutes in boiling water, then you can directly mold it to the amputee's residual limb, and he can start walking in less than two hours. Uh, plus, the material is remoldable, so whenever the stump goes through major changes, instead of getting new sockets, he can just reuse Amparo once uh, over and over again. Well, with Amparo then, we believe that it's more accessible because clinics treat five times more patients in the same amount of time. They save on materials, and more important, they can treat patients outside of a clinic, so they have mobile treatments, meaning they can reach patients and amputees everywhere a clinic doesn't reach. 
Um, uh, we have done extensive research in Brazil, India, South Africa, Germany, and in the USA. We built our proof of concept prototype, have two patents pending, and we're about to enter the market in the middle of next year. Uh, we will start clinical trials in the end of this year. And we have already talked to many different people, and we will enter the market in Brazil, uh, which we have already demonstrated a product for more than 50 clinics, and with a great feedback, actually. Because Brazil has currently 4 million amputees living there and 50,000 new amputees every year. Well, this represents a demand for 500,000 sockets in a millionaire market if you get into it. But most important, actually, uh, since I started to talk, at least 10 people became an amputee in the developing world. And our goal is actually to empower amputees, to make them not dependent on other people, give them opportunity to go back to work, to go back to have a normal life, and leave the poverty cycle they're in. We want to empower MPTs and show it's possible to have a life without, limit, without limitations. Thank you very much. Amparo, it's an inspiring goal and it's a pitch with a prop. I like it. Let's bring up Bluebird Technologies, our next startup. Welcome. Thank you guys and thanks for taking the time to listen to us. So at Bluebird we focus on people with mental disorders and specifically we're looking at people with uh, borderline personality disorder and post-traumatic stress disorder. And if you look at borderline personality disorder, this is a, a disease that, is, uh, that l makes people have a very hard time keep staying emotionally stable during the day. And they have m maybe multiple emotional and psychological crises during the day which lead to they're not being able to live a normal working life. It leads to self-harm and potentially even suicide attempts. And many of, of the borderline uh, patients regularly hospitalize themselves in order to, to avoid the, the, the dreaded effects of these crises. So it's, it's a very demanding disease and it's very, very hard for patients, but it's also very expensive for insurers and for society in general. So what we at Bluebird do is that we provide patients with these disorders with a personal therapy assistance system that runs on their smartphone and we use the data collected through the smartphone to prevent, uh, prevent these uh, crises from happening and make it possible for the patients to regain control of their own emotions. Now, if you look at the kind of sensors and, and the kind of data that we can, like, can collect through the smartphone, then and there has been some research that we can use this to, to also have an insight into the emotional state of the patient. So these are things like listening to how, how much you've slept, uh, whether you've had uh, social contacts um, during the day, how much interaction you've done. And these kind of things are also very important uh, to uh, important indicators for psychological crises. So we use all that data and use machine learning and artificial intelligence to predict the probability of when the next crisis is going to happen and to pro provide the patient with personalized therapeutic interventions at the right moment. And thereby we can avoid uh, the crisis or mitigate the effects of the crisis and make sure that the, that the patient is able to uh, sort of live through the day in a uh, stable as possible situation. So uh, we're so far working together with uh, Charité and Free University in Berlin to make sure that uh, the first stages of our prototypes are tested in a clinical setting and we hope to help um, up to 100 million uh, patients in West Europe and North America uh, regain control of their emotions. Thank you very much. Okay, Uber Technologies, thank you very much. Finishing right on time. Please welcome Diafit, our next startup. Thank you. Hello everybody. So what is Diafit? Our aim is to help diabetic people who have needs of insulin um, in their everyday life. So we are developing a device that will help every diabetic person to estimate the optimal amount of insulin and that over the day. The thing is, 8% of the world population has diabetes and this number has a tendency to increase. And I'm sure if I ask you, one of you may, may have diabetes or know someone who has diabetes. And this is a very big problem for diabetic people because they never know how much insulin they need. We are now developing our first app, a fitness app, to help diabetic people in their journey. Um, we started to develop in May. 
our first prototype should be ready by the end of the month, so we are quite happy with that. And we will launch in December when everything goes as planned. We aim to raise until 1.5 million US dollars through crowdfunding, so follow us on Twitter. Um, and the thing we realized is that people and like big companies and researchers don't understand diabetes fully. Either they don't know what it is to live with diabetes, so the challenges we have, or they don't understand diabetes as an illness, or they just lack the capacity to develop a mathematical modeling of the human pancreas, which produces insulin. Um, we plan to offer the app for 10 euros a month and to, um, as soon as possible. Uh, we are a team of five. We have three engineers, one designer and I. And if you have any questions, you can visit me at my booth on the number one LSTEC. All right, Daifi, thank you very much. Our next startup is Ego Health. Hello, everybody. I'm a medical doctor and also co-founder of Ego Health. Have you ever seen one of these? A stethoscope. Have you ever seen someone disinfecting it? Nope. Why? Because normally health professionals tend to forget about that. They always run from one patient to another patient. They have to look for the cotton pad and the disinfectant, and they tend to forget. The point is that uh, the stethoscope is contaminated as the dominant part of the hands. And hands are one of the major vehicles of transmission of bacteria and possible cause of hospital infection. Just a few numbers, 100,000 people die because of infection. 40 billion of euros are spent because of hospital acquired infection. 5% could be attributable to, to the stethoscope. Uh, we want to try to find out a solution which was easy to be adaptable to the health professionals and also easy for the health professional to, rem not to remember to do something else. So we found out, uh, uh, we, we care about the technological aspect and we come up with this solution, StatClean, which is a device which uses ultraviolet sea lights to disinfect the stethoscope members automatically. You don't have to do anything else than attach the stethoscope head here. Oops. At this start to disinfect. You can forget about that. Five minutes is the time you need to disinfect the stethoscope and it can be used and use it again. At the same, in this moment, we are in the launching phases of the product. It has a microprocessor inside who assures that everything is working properly. And its, its innovation is on the health field and also on the photonic field because we are using UVC light from LED. So we are actually innovating also in this part of, uh, of the products. Um, another important issue is about uh, the product is that uh, it is not only the disinfection of the stethoscope. It's always the way it is carried because it's, it is here attached to the health professional coat so everyone can see the device and be prone to adapt good practice hygiene every time he's going to choose to, to do anything else. So if you are if you're interested and you want to, to know a little bit more, H4 is the boot where I'm staying, okay? Thank you very much, Ego Health. <laughs> We've got one more startup in this round. Please welcome HealNet. Hello? Mm -hmm. Well, healthcare. We believe that there's something missing, or let's say there are some points which definitely should be improved in healthcare. For example, let's take the homes and offices. They do not have an on-site health station, requiring people to travel to medical sites even for the most basic health information. There is also no possibility to store multiple clinical health data um, with just one device. You have to use many different devices and even the smartphone. And most importantly, let's take a statistic from the US, there are at least 200,000 heart-related deaths each year which are preventable. So let's take your home 15 years in the future. Can you imagine to live without a diagnostic health station in sight? I'm not sure, maybe it's the future. So we at Hillmed created a voice control home-based diagnostic and um, health system or device where you just put your hands for five to ten seconds and you measure up to seven different vital parameters. 
It's um, voice controlled and it's very easy to use. So you get the clinical data. You normally have, if you have to travel to the doctor, you get the clinical data in a very easy way at home and you can um, like interpret it in a very easy way because of the voice control. You get an app where you have the, um, um, the, the visualized um, things. And um, yeah, finally, like you get up to seven vital parameters. And at the moment, we have two different kind of um, prototypes. So we have ECG, we have um, skin temperature, we have, um, I'm sorry, um, and three more. And uh, with this, you get a baseline of your health. And um, this baseline shows you, like, or when you use it every day, you get a deviation of the baseline. So you know when you ever, whenever you deviate from the baseline, in a good or in a bad way. So um, basically, it's for prevention care. And we hope that we can save millions of lives because we know sometimes that there is a heart stroke, but you don't feel it. But our device would feel it. And our device would tell you, you should go to the doctor because this... Um, disease becomes life-threatening and the possibility to save millions of lives is there. But if you want to know more, if you want to see the device, it's actually uh, shaped like a ball and you touch it for five to ten seconds. And if you want to see a picture of the device, please feel free to come to our booth and I can show you and explain a bit more. All right, Thanks. thank you very much. Heal Matt. A big round of applause for all of our startups because it's not easy to distill your business idea into two and a half minutes. It's not easy to give a presentation about it in English on this big stage. Great job, guys. We're going to have another lightning round of startup pitches in a few minutes. But first, we want to hear an insider's perspective of how the field of med tech is changing due to recent developments in technology. Please welcome Boris Hoffman of Askula. Boris? Thank you very much. Um, as said, I would like to talk about MedTech today, tomorrow, and beyond, which also kind of represents our booth we have over there, which I warmly invite you to, um, to discuss all these topics. Um, as you see, I'm from B. Braun, and it was just mentioned Esculab, which is one division of B. Braun. And before starting with the, with the today, tomorrow, and beyond, I would like to say some words to B. Braun. Our mission is to protect and improve the health of people around the world. And that is exactly so. On the one hand, protect. On the other one uh, hand, to improve. That is exactly what we try to do. So for B. Brown, is is really going into communication with partners, with startups, with customers, and creating value together. And therefore, I would, as there are many startups in the room, I would warmly invite you also to the booth and to discuss topics, how we can share expertise, how we can work together, how we can influence each other. At a glance, B. Braun has about 55,000 employees and uh, we are active in 64 countries and have a turnover uh, or sales of roughly 6.2 billion euros. So a pretty big company, but family-owned um, German company. And this is also represented in the amount of corporate social responsibility projects, um, where we do a lot of those activities. But let's come to the today um, and how is MedTech today and what are companies, especially B. Braun, working on. And uh, therefore, I would like to, to start with a product portfolio that we have. And I'm not going into detail into um, of all of these topics, but just to show you the broad portfolio. On the one hand, we're working on acute dialysis, incontinence, infection prevention, pain therapy, um, on also wound management, and not to forget general open surgery and laparoscopy, things like that. So it's a pretty broad portfolio, but it's not about, today is not about selling single products to the hospital, but it is about how to bring value to the hospital, and with that also the products. So we understand ourselves as a solution provider. So when the patient enters the hospital, he will be treated with more than one product from, from the B. Brown portfolio, and he will leave the hospital, go to rehabilitation, um, for example, and there will be further treated, for example, in the stoma, uh, stoma care. 
Um, so the question is, how can we do that? And we do that by linking the therapy field with our expertise and also linking the, the, different, the different stakeholders like the pharmacist, surgeon, the hospital and administration because there's more and more buying decisions switching from a surgeon um, to a hospital administration so you need to provide value to, um, to them and to show them. And so we are linking that. Um, we provide process optimization within the hospital in order to, to create value for them, um, but also share our expertise um, and, and make them work together. And by that, really fulfill the total pathway, as we call it. So really following the patient through the hospital to rehabilitation. This is also shown in the Escolab Academy, um, a partner um, uh, for medical training and education. So we do train surgeons and medical professionals in several fields. So in 2015, for example, we trained about 74,000 people worldwide um, and gave them access to new technologies, to new to new products and made them aware of that and with that brought uh, safer treatments to hospitals and, and more knowledge to hospitals. But this is more on the, on the solution side. Um, if we're talking about products and what is currently going on in the field, we see that, and I'm sorry for the, for the really crappy slide there, um, it's somehow messed up. Um, one example is miniaturization. So in surgery in general, miniaturization is very important. Um, we see new surgical techniques that are enabled by, by that. We see if we look at um, visualization and, and better camera systems, 3D visualization um, brought into, into, into the OR, we see that we have a reduction of trauma for the patient, uh, faster recovery, shorter hospitalization time, lower amount of total cost, and in some points also access to treatment for patients that would otherwise not be treatable. So minimally invasive approaches um, are something that um, can help patients that could not uh, undergo surgery, for example. One example you can see in the bottom left corner if you look at sternotomy. So that is something where you, where you open the chest in order to reach the heart and do surgery there. Normally you do a, a large cut, open the chest and do surgery. Nowadays it moves more and more towards smaller incisions, smaller access, but therefore you need really good visualization in order to perform the to perform the surgery on site in a very small cavity. And this is, for example, um, realizable with the Einstein vision system, a 3D endoscopy system, which can also be seen at our booth. And you can really try it, try it out on, on your own and see the difference between a 2D system to a 3D one where you can really have a perception of depth and a 3D vision. But also robotic surgery is more and more coming more and more, and you see here the Da Vinci system, which um, really provides freedom in like you have with your hands via minimal access ports. So that is also something where you see um, improvement of, of treatment with less trauma and by that better outcomes. What is happening in Metech? We are talking about tomorrow. We see or at the booth. We discuss four topics, um, and are happy to discuss with you four topics. On the one hand, the center of innovation, the brain factories. Sören Lauinger gave a short talk on the on the on the stage uh, about that. So this is a co-creation center we are currently setting up where we really want to provide value beyond the product. So see our customers and um, want to, to share with them our approaches, but also want to get their input on, on problems they have and on solutions they need, which are not related to the product. So this is kind of working like a startup where you can do fast uh, prototyping, where you can work on um, on, on, or create in a very fast way and uh, thus solve problems for customers. There we are also happy to, to all four topics to invite you to discuss at the booth. Um, second topic is big data and health. So mm -hmm. how to provide value 
based on data. On the one hand, the data needs to be there, but just having data and analyzing it, it does not uh, generate value yet. So value could be value to the patient, uh, to the hospital, or to partners. And this is something very important for us, for example, knowing about the um, the lifetime of our products, how many sterilization cycles did they undergo, um, what is total cost of ownership, all that we need data for. This is on a small basis. If we look at the, the patient and if you look at disease uh, patterns related to, to individual status of the patient, this is then on a bigger scale. The third one is future of hospitals and rehabilitation. And there's the question that we, that we raised, how will future treatment look like? So we will for sure have need better outcome. We need faster rehabilitation of the patients and all that provided with lower costs. And this is something very, very tricky because uh, treatments get more and more, uh, more expensive. Um, at the same time, the, the cost pressure increases. The, the, age, the society is aging. There's more cost for healthcare systems and how to work on that. So how can we provide um, value to, to hospitals that they can, for example, re release the patient to their home earlier and still monitor what they are doing. So rehabilitation after hip or knee surgery, for example. Um, physiotherapy, is there a need for a patient to be in the hospital or can that be done at home and monitored um, from by the physiotherapist in the hospital and only interact with the patient if there's some, some problems occurring? And finally, the out-of-the-box extending the team topic is we would like to discuss how to work with startups because startups, the, the need is not only for money. I'm pretty sure all startups need funding, um, but they also need guidance and someone who has access to the market. They need a partner to discuss things and how to implement that, um, a partner who probably has access to the whole market. Entrepreneurs, are there ideas that, that could be developed together with us, um, users of products? And finally, you, if you have an idea that could fit to our portfolio, we are very happy to, to discuss with you and maybe find a way how to, um, how to create a business together. All that is with the question is in mind, what could disrupt our business? So we are aware that there's a huge change going on currently and that business can be disrupted. But the question is, um, how uh, is our business affected and how can we, can we be part of that? Again, I'm sorry for the slide. Um, one example for all that, what I just mentioned is digitalization. We see connection of all available data. We see um, a huge step into the quantified self. And we also see new digital business fields and models um, that could be of value for us. But um, we also see that we need a way how to deal with uh, data safety. If you look at one of the headlines, uh, hacked medical devices may be the biggest cybersecurity threat in 2016. This can be true. There were insulin pumps hacked. There were anesthesia devices hacked. Um, and this is something that is very critical in, in health tech um, or in all other areas too. But here we are dealing with uh, life of patients. Um, so on the one hand, the data safety of patient data, but also system safety are things that are very important. And I'm looking forward to exchanging also with the fintech sector, for example, because they are well aware of data safety and how to deal with that. But this is not only, it's not only the safety, it's more holistic approach from the planning um, where you have 3D visualization, where you can plan your, your each and every step in more detail and prepare for what might come up to rehabilitation where we're talking about smaller devices um, like pacemakers that fit directly into the heart. Um, or um, autologous um, implants made from own material of the body so it can't be rejected or will not be rejected um, to uh, prevention and yeah, treatment. So it's not only, as I said, the protect and improve the health of people around the world. It's not just improving by doing surgeries. If we can protect it and kind of prevent surgery, this would also already be a very good good thing to do. And if you're finally, if you're talking about the 
beyond. There are some mega trends with influence on medtech. On the one hand, there's uh, the demographic change um, with increased life expectancy, um, increase of population, uh, overpopulation of specific areas that we see, but depopulation of other areas, and definitely changing requirements of, of an aging society. All that will have influence on the whole um, healthcare system. So how will we pay for that? If I look at diabetes numbers that are currently on, and we had a, a startup talking about that, uh, this is increasing and increasing. And personally, I think we need solutions for that. On the second uh, thing is that we have a huge progress in, in health. So we have increased hygiene and life standards. We have change of disease patterns and this increasing healthcare costs are talked about w with an increasing uh, price pressure. Also, the technicalization and individualization of medicine are two things that kind of drift apart a bit but uh, belong together. On the one hand, if you can do treatments based on, based on your DNA profile, you need a huge number of, of uh, huge data set to analyze exactly how the DNA profile should look like to do a personalized treatment. But the treatment itself will be very personalized to an individual. So all this also brings up a uh, rising amount of ethical questions. And uh, yeah, that is... And the last two things I would like to talk about is on the one hand, the internet and digitalization. So we see computer-based support in more and more areas. Um, we see that corporates try to work like a startup. We see that we have new ways of communication and also data analysis and us usage in real time. So all this does have an influence on the health tech sector. And if we're talking about intelligent products and infrastructure, we see that there's a development of information technology, sensors and robotics, and this kind of can disrupt um, the advancement or the advancements in nanotechnology and bionics can disrupt the, the business as it is today or the treatment as it is today. We also see fusion of technologies, so technologies from consumer electronics coming into, into, uh, into the health tech sector or from, from other fields, um, and also cooperation and fusi fusion of man and machines. And with that, I would like to apologize for the slides that got messed up in some way, um, but I hope I could uh, explain it even without the slides showing everything that is important. And I'm happy to, to welcome you at the booth to discuss all these topics, but also open for questions now. Thank you. Would anyone like to ask a question? We can get you a microphone. Just raise your hand, don't be shy. Okay, no questions. No questions. Uh, we'll move right along just to keep Thank things you. on track. Thank you very much, Boris Hoffman from Askelab. You can take that with you. We're gonna go back to another round of startups. It's a lightning round. Each startup is gonna come on stage. They have two and a half minutes to pitch you, our audience, on their business idea, just as if you were perhaps in an elevator. So I'm gonna be keeping the time. These are our health tech startups, the second round. Please welcome Hindsight. Thank you. Hi, my name is Pinaki Das Gupta. I'm from Hindsight, Artificial Intelligence for Better Healthcare. So imagine a future where we talked about precision medicine, but even before an adverse events may occur, what if artificial intelligence could predict, detect, inform your physicians, inform your spouse, get the ambulance ready at your door, and the care managers are ready to take care of you all this before it happened. And that future is not too far. And that future is what we are building in hindsight. So who are we? We are engineers, we are doctors, we are nurses, PhDs, data scientists. We put together the team in New Jersey, United States. And today our system is live. We process roughly 25,000 prior authorizations request per month for about 35 different health plans through our client Magellan Health since 2015. 
And what we do is to prevent unnecessary services. Now, in, in US healthcare, which is slightly different than yours, payers, health insurance companies, they manage utilization. And it's well-known fact that in healthcare today, we do over-testing, over-diagnostic testing, procedures which are not necessary. And health plans require providers to obtain a prior authorization before a test could, or diagnostics could be performed, like MRI, CT, whatnot. And then they hire nurses and doctors to review those requests to make sure they meet clinical necessity criteria and subject to those meeting criteria, they either approve or deny those requests. Now, because of human errors and biases, we see a lot of decisions are made which are either approvable decisions are denied or deniable decisions are approved. So when we brought it into our platform by applying machine learning, natural language processing, so NLP essentially extracts all the clinical concepts, machine learns from the historical data as well as all the clinical necessity criteria protocol, and then by predictive analytics, we score between zero and one. If it's close to zero, it's deniable. If it's close to one, it's approvable. So by doing that, we are changing the healthcare. There are new, exciting applications, use cases that we are building, which will help eliminate some of those, not just unnecessary services, but will help doctors and clinicians to make the right decision based on protocol, guidelines, and truth. Thank the you. elevator doors are opening. Thank you very much, Hindsight, for your two and a half minute pitch. Let's bring up our next startup, Nevis Q. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Hello, welcome. My name is Dennis Boyer, and I'm one of the four founders of Nevis Q. Um, the problem we are solving is quite known, I guess, uh, of all of you, faults of elderly people. We developed in the last month a solution which allows nurses, especially in nursing care homes, to detect and to prevent faults. How we do that? We simply install small baseboards uh, on the bottom in the room of each resident of a nursing care home. This uh, installation allows us to track all the activities within a room and identify for sure faults and we can prevent them. How we do that, for example? If at night uh, an elderly person wants to get to the toilet, she is mostly disoriented and um, doesn't really know what to do. Our solution switches slightly the lights off and will, um, the nurses will be uh, notified um, that the resident in the room needs maybe help. So the nurse can immediately support the resident. Uh, and of course, if there's a case of a fall, the nurse is also uh, notified. Last but not least, we do some kind of an individual risk uh, analysis uh, of each uh, resident so that we can predict the falling risk. And if the nurse knows how the falling risk of an uh, elderly person is, they can directly activate this person again and bring them back to more mobility and uh, help them to not fall again. Yeah, right now we are in startup, uh, started in 2015, founded in Aachen, uh, at the RWTH Aachen, and um, we are a Fexist funded team, and we have access to money till end of March. So we're looking for partners in the industry, and uh, for sure in the future for uh, investors. Thank you very much. Nevis Q, thank you very much. Our next startup is non-invasive medical devices. Come on up. Your two and a half minutes starts now. Thank Good you. luck. One of eight women are uh, suffering from breast cancer. Half of them die because of the treatment itself. Hi, my name is Butros. I'm from NIMD, non-invasive medical devices. I came here to present my new medical device that combines two technologies, nanotechnology and microwave technology. This combination enables us to focus microwave beams on tumors, solid tumors inside the patient's body that are preceded with nanoparticles. The nanoparticles absorb the microwave and they convert it into heat. We showed result, results on experiments on animals that we can 
reach up to 60 degrees centigrade. This temperature enables us to burn, actually, the cancer cells selectively because the nanoparticles are present only in the cancer cells. They are not present in the healthy cells due to EPR effect, enhanced permeability and retention. Um, we are now uh, focusing our efforts on uh, uh, making some advances in, in, the, in this device. It has also some potential abilities to uh, scan the patient and diagnose early stage cancer. Our team consists of PhD holders from physics to chemical physics, physical chemistry. We have a versatile uh, group. We are based in Jerusalem, in Israel, and uh, we have uh, approached the CE mark. We are applying for it, and then we're going towards the FDA. I would be glad for questions. A two and a half minute pitch with time for questions. I call that impressive. Quick question, anyone want to? You guys are so shy. How long do you think it's gonna take you to get FDA approval? <laughs> it's not yet approved, it's, it's submitted. How long do you think you need? Oh, we need maybe three years, uh, sorry, two years up to be in two markets. All right, good luck with yep. that. Non-invasive medical devices, thank, thank you, you very much. Let's pull up our next startup, Novio Sense. Come on up. So we've got 2.30 on the clock, here you go. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> How cool is this show? I'm really enjoying it. Okay. I'm going to talk to you about NaviSense. And first, I'm a diabetic, so I'm going to practice what I preach. NaviSense is a medical device company. We're active in the diabetes space. Uh, this is the current best of the rest. It's a Bluetooth-enabled device. Fits on your body here. Small needle goes into your body. Comes out, leaves a patch behind. It's really great. Links with your phone, probably, eventually. Sends data back and forth. Problem is, I've got two kids. And this lasts about 10 seconds before my kids pull it off. That's a bit longer when I'm playing squash, about half an hour. So, actually, it's a nice device, but it cost me 50 euros, and I probably need like 10 of them a month. So, we came up with a, an idea. Can we take a glucose monitor, and can we do something different with it? So, yeah, we take a, something somewhat smaller, and I hope none of you can see this. A little device like this. We drop it just here in the lower eyelid. Then you take any NFC-equipped cell phone, bring it up to your eye, and you have your glucose results. So, NoviaSense is taking the, the idea of having a device that goes in your body, putting it somewhere completely different, and letting you bring any device you want that has NFC technology in it to read your glucose measurements. We were founded in 2012. We got our first clinical data back last year, and this week we close our second, our fourth uh, financing round, which will take us through the, the clinical phase of clinical validation. And uh, hopefully uh, next year you'll hear from us uh, that we have successful uh, clinical validation of the device in diabetics. I even have time for questions as well. Talk loud. Yeah, it's super simple. We take a a test strip, exactly the same technology as in test strips, enzyme-based technology, and we stick it on a spring. Actually, we have the same accuracy as the invasive devices. In some cases, actually, we beat Medtronic. You got time for one more, I think. Absolutely. We designed the device with exactly the right dimensions. It sits in the pocket. It's the right size to fill the pocket, and it doesn't come out. Yeah, if you pit, stick your finger in your eye and do like that, it'll come out. If you're doing sport, if you're running around, if you have two crazy kids like I do, it doesn't come out. <laughs> All right. That, that's impressive. Two questions in 2.30. You might have a future as an auctioneer. Thank you very much. Let's bring up our next startup, Spin Diag. Welcome. 2.30 on the clock. Here you go. Thank you. Spindiac is a company located in Freiburg, Germany. Our team consists of six researchers and an experienced entrepreneur who set out to join the fight against antibiotic-resistant bacteria, one of today's severest health problems. 
More than 500,000 patients are infected every year by other patients in German hospitals alone. 15,000 of these patients die of the infection. What makes this matter worse is the emergence and spread of antibiotic-resistant bacteria frustrates our abilities to treat these infections effectively. Today, antibiotic-resistant bacteria are brought to hospitals, their patients and staff by other patients without anyone noticing. Screening of risk patients is seen as an, um, a good tool yeah. to, um, to reduce these infections. However, conventional technologies still take two to three days to diagnose a patient. In the meantime, the hospital is left with a dilemma to either isolate a patient on suspicion, which is quite costly, or to risk that the patient may infect others. Spindiac addresses this unmet need of hospitals by providing a fast, broad and affordable detection of antibiotic resistant pathogens. With our system, patients can be screened directly at their admission and um, infected patients can be treated in isolation, protecting other patients from getting infected. Our system uh, consists of a low cost, easy to use um, disposable and a, portable, and a portable device. All there is for the nurse to do is take a regular swab sample, um, like they always would do, put the swab directly into our disposable, and run the disposable into our, in our device. The results are available just 30 minutes after. We want to make this screening available to hospitals to keep their patients and staff safe. Thank you. Thank you very much. We know suffering. We also know how expensive it is for the healthcare system. One major factor for the costs due to chronic diseases is because people with these illnesses are forgetting to take their pill. This simple movement causes big problems. I am Esteban. We are Wear Health, and we are solving this problem with machine learning and data from wearables. So let me explain you a little bit, how does this work? You might, know, you might say, yeah, my uncle has a reminder. He's using an app. It reminds him when to take the pill. Of course, this, those products are out there. They help you to log data intake, pill intake, and they help you to remind you. There's also smart boxes that track when you take a pill. But they still fail. They don't solve the problem because they don't analyze on an individual level why are you forgetting to take the pill in the first place? That's where we come in. We take off-the-shelf wearables, such as the Apple Watch or the Microsoft Band. We analyze the data and we understand the context. For example, if somebody's driving in the car, he's going to his house, should a system tell him, please take your pill? Of course not, because probably he won't take it. Or should, my, should a system remind me right now while I'm pitching, take your pill? I will probably forget it because I won't listen to it. Our system understands this, learns from it, and finds the unique moments and the most appropriate moments for that person to take the pill. In addition, with the help of the wearables, we're able to track pill intake. We know, based on the gesture of the hand, that the person took a pill. We know that the person is eating. We know that the person is, has drinking water or is smoking. We are a B2B company. We are offering our solutions to health insurances, reinsurances, and pharmaceuticals. At the moment, we are based in Germany. We have an office in Bremen, an office in Munich. We are working there with the biggest uh, reinsurance in the world, the Munich Re. And we're working on a medical trial in Zurich. My co-founder, Michael, is here. We're happy to talk to you, so please come to our stand. Thank you. Thank you. Wear Health, ending right on time there. Let's get a big round for all of our startups. That was pretty impressive. There were some really good ideas in that mix. Great job, guys. I'm really impressed. <laughs>